Thank you. I have to say hi, everyone, on the video. Um, nice that you're all here. We're going to have uh, five evenings that we're going to talk about Bodhicitta. And uh, for those who are interested, on the Sunday, then we have a day where we talk about compassion for self and us, which are very much related or even interconnected with each other. Um, the basis for Bodhicitta is compassion. Uh, in order to develop bodhicitta, we need compassion. In order to sustain bodhicitta, we need compassion. And in order to keep working for the sake of others, once we have um, realized our goal, then we also need compassion. So compassion is very, very important for the bodhicitta. Um, so I think this is a great opportunity. Can you please start? <laughs> <laughs> I'm hearing myself <laughs> one second later. Um, I think this is a fantastic opportunity to really look into how we can use our mind, how we can use the potential of our mind in order to develop ourselves further, not just for our own sake. But also, if we start looking into the teachings of on bodhicitta, we can see that uh, the teachings on bodhicitta, they are, or once we generate bodhicitta in the mind, it is very beneficial for ourselves, but also for others. I actually should say it is very beneficial for others, but also for ourselves. Right? What we try to do is we try to put others and others' well-being before our own well-being. Um, that is kind of counterintuitive, right? If you really listen intellectually to the teachings, you think this is insane. Why would I do that? You know, this is so uh, the opposite of what I always have been trying to do. But we will look into today why it actually makes a lot of sense to generate the bodhicitta mind, right? We can look into the way that we try to find happiness and in, in a, how much happiness we have found so far, how successful we have been so far. And if we can see that so far, we actually haven't been that successful in finding our ways to happiness. You know? And then if we see why, why we are not able to find happiness in the way we are doing it now, then if you see that, then bodhicitta makes so much sense. It makes so much sense. And then you can understand why bodhicitta mind is good for others, but it is also very, very good for ourselves. It's actually the, the mind that can make us most happy of all the minds. Um, so what we're gonna do, what I thought about doing is um, that we're gonna talk about the two methods to develop bodhicitta, of course, which are the seven course and effect instruction and the exchanging self for others. And maybe you already have heard of these methods. So we will talk about that. And we will talk about that once we have achieved the mind of enlightenment, then, then how do we think? How do we speak? How do we act? You know, We say we want to become, um, when once we have realized bodhicitta, we become bodhisattvas. You know? So if we want to become a bodhisattva, so even getting an idea what a bodhisattva is, we need to know what does the bodhisattva think? How does he or she think? How does he or she speak? How does he or she behave, act in relationship to others? Right? So we can talk about that. We can talk about um, practicing bodhicitta in daily life. You know, and this was very much one of Lama Zoparimpshe's wishes for us to do, to remember bodhicitta every day in all our actions, uh, from waking up till going to bed, you know, everything that happens in between, how can we do that with a bodhicitta motivation? Once we start generating a bodhicitta motivation in daily life or at any time, the merit that we create is so vast. The purification that happens in our mind is so incredible. Right. So it is actually a very fast method 
to purify our mind and to accumulate merit. And if we want to achieve, well, we always talk about we want to achieve enlightenment, but even if you want to achieve anything in life, we need purification and we need merit. So bodhicitta is really the best way to do that. <clears throat> um, and so we will also talk about the benefits of generating bodhicitta and why it is so difficult for us. What is holding us back from doing that, right? Because we maybe have heard the teachings, but then it sounds almost like impossible. How can you do that? You know, oh, I can sometimes think about putting others first, but all the time, you know? And I can think about putting my mother or my children or whoever I love first, but those that I don't like, why would I do that, right? What is holding us from that? What is, what is um, our motivation that it makes bodhicitta so difficult? I think when you can see that, and when you see what we try to achieve in our normal behavior, and if you see why we cannot be successful, then bodhicitta can become more accessible, I think. And even the thought, oh, actually, that is something that I can do, that is something that I want to do, that is a possibility. It is right there. It is just a practice, something that I need to habituate my mind to. Right, it says somewhere in the text, we have been cherishing ourselves <clears throat> since the beginning of this time, right? And in this life, since the beginning of this life, independence on this body, we cherish ourselves. Oh, my body wants this, my body wants this. And so it says that, but your body is not your body. Your body is not from you, right? It comes from your mom and your dad. They came together, and because the sperm and the egg came together and grew, and your, your consciousness was there, and it grew out to the human being that you are, you call this my body. And you started cherishing this as if it is yours. So they say, that's just a habit. This was not your body before. It was your mom and dad's, and you just started calling it yours. Right. So we can do that also with with when we think about others, you know, if if I can learn to cherish this body, which is not mine, then why can I not learn to cherish your body and your body and your body? Right. I got habituated to this one, then I can also habituate my mind to cherishing others. Right. <laughs> Buddhism always gets us a little bit in a, I'm not sure, sometimes it feels like we're getting in a knot, but I think it actually undoes the knots that we already have. <clears throat> so that is what I would like to do. And anything else that you bring up, we can uh, add that to what we like to discuss. <clears throat> So when we think about bodhicitta, when we think about the teachings, then, of course, Lama Zoprimpeshe, I feel he is, he is, I'm not sure if I'm saying that as his student, but I think he is one of the greatest or the greatest bodhisattva that has been living at our time. The way that he used his mind, generating bodhicitta moment after moment, benefiting sentient beings, each and every sentient being that was in front of him, whether that was a human being or an insect or a dog or, or any creature, the hungry ghosts, the, he, he was benefiting. He was there for each and every one of them, benefiting, only benefiting. So if we think about bodhicitta and, and, and what a bodhisattva, is and how the Bodhisattva thinks and how the Bodhisattva acts, we have a great example to look at. Right? But then, of course, also His Holiness the Dalai Lama. And maybe you have other teachers who are an example for you in how to practice Bodhicitta. 
So this is how we can learn. They are our role models. Just by being with them, looking at them, listening to them, our mind gets nourished. And the seeds of bodhicitta that we have in our mind, you know, they get nourished. They can start ripening. Then we also have the teachings, the scriptural teachings. And the famous, one of the, uh, I think that is the most famous teachings on bodhicitta are the teachings from Shantideva, the Bodhisattva's way of life, right? Where he described from, from how to aspire for the mind of enlightenment all the way how to develop the mind of enlightenment. Right? So that is a great example and a great resource that we can use. And then <clears throat> Lama Zuparimashe, he was very much inspired by uh, Kunu Lama Rinpoche. And um, I think he was a lay practitioner. I don't know too much about his life, but he there is a little book, a little book from him on Bodhicitta. And Lama Zuparimashe, Rinpoche, he always referred to Kunu Lama Rinpoche about the, his teachings and about the way he spoke about Bodhicitta. And that was the most inspiring for Lama Zuparimashe. So we can also look into these teachings. <clears throat> so far, so good. So that's my little introduction about what we are going to do or what we inspire to do. And so maybe then when we start this session today, we can set a good motivation. <clears throat> maybe just closing our eyes for a couple of minutes, relaxing the mind. I'm sure that you all had a very busy day and maybe you have been running to get here and the mind is a bit busy or agitated or uh, still in the busyness of what you have been doing. And so let's give that mind a couple of minutes to really arrive at where you are right now, where your body is right now. Whether that is here at the Shita or at your home. And the best way to let your mind arrive is by focusing the mind on your body. When we focus the mind on the body, we bring the mind in the here and now. So you don't have to focus on one particular part of the body or aspect of the body. You can let the mind rest in general. And it's okay if the mind wants to move on the body. as long as it stays with the body. So while we focus our mind on the body, we make a conscious effort to let go of that mind that is still running, running into the future. Maybe you're already thinking about what you're going to do after this session. So 
So if that is the case, bring all that energy that is now engaged in the future also to your body. Knowing that by being with the body, by being in the here and now, you prepare best for the future. And the same we do with all the thoughts that are still occupied in the past. Maybe you didn't finish what you wanted to finish. Maybe something didn't go right in the way you wanted it today. And you're still going over that, trying to change that. So with the knowledge that no matter how many times you think over that, you cannot change what already has happened. You bring the mind to the body. And then when all your energy has arrived in the present moment, you can breathe in and breathe out a few times deeply. Truly arriving at the place where you are right now. And then generate a good motivation. For being here today. For listening to these teachings. And we can, for instance, think that by listening to these teachings that we would like to develop our potential for wisdom and compassion. So that we can be of greatest benefit. to all those around us, to all sentient beings. So what is bodhicitta? <clears throat> bodhicitta is <clears throat> the wish to attain full enlightenment for the benefit of all sentient beings. <clears throat> and so there is a lot of information in that definition and we will pull it together during these teachings. And so it says that there are many ways to develop realizations on the path. For instance, we can develop um, 
single point of concentration, or we can develop equanimity, or we can develop the wisdom realizing emptiness, or we can understand karma really well. But it says there is no better realization than the realization of bodhicitta. <clears throat> bodhicitta means in Sanskrit, bodhi means awakened, and chitta means mind. So it is the, the mind that strives for full awakening. Full awakening of what? Full awakening of our potential, our potential for wisdom and compassion. At the moment, that potential of wisdom and compassion is um, not awake, right? it is kind of asleep. Uh, we cannot see the nature of reality. We cannot see our own potential to develop our mind. We cannot see many, many things. Right? And not only is there not seeing, there is also a distorted seeing. Many things in terms of reality, we see the things opposite to how they actually are. Right? So our mind is obscured. Our mind is ignorant. Our mind is asleep. It is not awake. So the mind of enlightenment is the mind that wants to wake up. Wake up to the nature of reality. Right. Sometimes we think Buddhism is about becoming a good human being. Right? Especially when we hear the teachings on bodhicitta. We want to become a good human being. But actually, Buddhism is about waking up the mind. Waking up the mind for the truth. And when we truly understand the truth, you know, often bodhicitta comes independence on that. You're getting cold. <laughs> You're sitting under the fan. <clears throat> so when we say we want to work for the benefit of sentient beings, you know, then we can say what is the best way to do that? The best way to work for the benefit of sentient beings is when we have developed our mind fully. Right? I can have now already some skills that can be of benefit to sentient beings. But the way I can benefit sentient beings now is nothing compared to when I would develop the mind of bodhicitta. Right? <clears throat> we all willing to help. Right? In many ways we help. We are kind human beings. But bodhicitta is, is more than being kind. Right? Really putting the benefit of others first before your own benefit is so extremely difficult. If we investigate how we benefit at the moment sentient beings and we look deeply in our motivation, then often there is still a, a kind of a selfish motivation behind that. Can I say that? You have seen that in your mind? I don't want to say anything unkind, but this is often what we do, right? For instance, you ask me to do something for you, and I really like you and I like our friendship, you know, and I'm scared that when I say no, that you won't like me anymore. So then I do that for you, right? And I feel happy when I do it for you and you feel happy and we think everything is fine, you know, this is kind of bodhicitta. But, but that act of kindness that I just did is coming from fear. I'm afraid of losing you. That's not bodhicitta, right? Bodhicitta has no fear of losing others. Bodhicitta is only, only focused on benefiting others, to make others happy. There's no fear there of losing others. There is fear of suffering there, right? As the Bodhisattva, I am very afraid for the suffering, your suffering. I don't want you to suffer. So then if you ask me for help, I help you because I don't want you to suffer. That's the fear of the Bodhisattva, the fear for suffering of others, but not the fear of losing someone. 
right? So we need to look deeply into our motivation, why we help, why we are kind, and then see if we need to adjust that. Right? If we truly have the wish to develop a tutor, we need to see how do we generate that motivation. What do I do today? What is my basis? And what do I need to purify maybe in that basis so that it becomes a healthy basis for bodhicitta? <clears throat> so when we have bodhicitta in our mind, then we are called bodhisattvas. Right? Bodhisattvas are the beings that work for the benefit of others. <clears throat> So why would we want to generate bodhicitta? And I've already mentioned that we can do that for ourselves and we can do that for others, right? The true bodhisattva generates bodhicitta for others, but he does that with, or she does that with the wisdom that by working in that way for others, that that is the best way of working for oneself, right? So we cannot say that a bodhisattva doesn't think about his or her own happiness. The bodhisattva knows really, really well that his or her happiness is perfectly served by working for the benefit of others. The bodhisattva knows that there is no contradiction between working for others and working for oneself. Right? There is a wisdom there that understands, wow, when I do this, automatically I'm benefiting myself as well. Right? We need to see that very, very, very clearly. <clears throat> so there is a benefit for oneself, there is a benefit for others. The benefit for others comes first, but with the knowledge that there is a benefit for self. Right? So the Bodhisattva doesn't think, I'm going to benefit myself, so therefore I'm going to benefit others. Right? The Bodhisattva thinks, I'm going to benefit all sentient beings because they're so close to my heart. And I can see their suffering, but at the same time in the background there is this wisdom that knows that that is the path forward. We try to analyze exactly why it is like that. <clears throat> so the Bodhisattva is motivated by compassion. Right? The Bodhisattva is motivated by compassion, and compassion means I want to free all sentient beings from their suffering. Compassion for one sentient being means I want to free you from suffering. For all sentient beings, I want to free all of them from suffering. And so in order to generate that mind, we need to understand suffering. Right? And suffering doesn't just refer to the suffering of pain, to all the unpleasant experiences that we have. But suffering also refers to, for instance, the all-pervasive suffering of conditioned existence. Right? The fact that we all react in certain ways, in certain patterns, and we repeat these, they come automatically, they come so easily. Oh, here I do it again, I follow again the pattern that I know so well, that brings me suffering, but somehow I do it, because I'm conditioned to behave in a certain way, to react in a certain way. So that is, according to Buddhism, the biggest suffering that we have. Because of that suffering, um, or that suffering refers to uh, the suffering of conditioned existence. It refers to the fact that we have a body, a body that is created by what we call karma and delusions. Right? Because our body is created by karma and delusions, our body produces karma and delusions. Right? All our actions all our reactions are karma and delusions. And then our body is under the influence of karma and delusions. The body or mind? The body. Also, also the mind, but also the body, right? 
the body is controlled by karma and illusions. Right? Our body is not free. The way that the body functions comes from karma and illusions. Right? If I strongly hold on to uh, certain delusions, for instance, I have very strong attachment, so strong attachment that I have a, a certain addiction, my body is reacting under the influence of that. Right? My body is not free from that. Then I follow my body. <clears throat> so that is the biggest suffering that all sentient beings suffer from. And so then if we look into sentient beings, then we see there are so many. There are so many sentient beings. Everywhere where we look, there are sentient beings. And they're all suffering. And they're all suffering from the same samsaric um, patterns. Right? We're all bound by samsara. We're all bound by our delusions. We all keep creating karma again and again. <clears throat> so therefore, because there are so many sentient beings, just freeing ourselves from suffering is not enough. Right? We are only one. We are only one sentient being. We are constantly working for one sentient being. While in actuality, there's so many. Right? Why do we choose for just this one? <laughs> Why don't we choose for, oh, I actually like you a lot, or I like you, I'm going to work for you. No, we only do it like this. I want to work for me. I need to be happy. I need to have what I want. Right? It's weird, right? We only work for one. Well, there's so many. <clears throat> And then in Buddhism, we think about others in the sense of if we look into our own experiences and our own happiness and the own good fortune that we have, where does it come from? Always sentient beings are involved. Right? If we look at where we are today now, everything that we have, that we brought with us, that brought you here, what did you do yourself? Right? We're sitting here. All this has come about independence upon others. Other people have been working really hard to establish this. Then you're sitting on a cushion, you're wearing clothes. Where are they coming from? Did you make them yourself? Maybe someone did. No, we didn't. We went to the shop and we bought them, right? And then we say, oh, but it was my money, you know, so. But where is the money coming from? You received that from someone, right? And they could say, but I worked for the money. Okay. But there's still someone who gives you the work and then who pays you money for the work. Right? That, that, that your boss doesn't have to do that. Your boss can find somebody else, but he has chosen you. So we can think, oh, that's kind. Right? Other beings have been so kind. Everything that I experience today all the good things that I experience today comes about in dependence upon the kindness of others. True. We think all the good things that I experience today comes because of me. And all the bad things that I experience comes about due to others. Right? That's the way that we think. But if you start analyzing, then you say, okay, what good has come about just because of you. What? And then you start thinking about an example, and it is impossible, you know. Even the body, where what 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 we have, independence on which we have all these experiences, is not coming from ourselves. Why is coming from others? due to the kindness of others. So we receive that kindness. And then we can think about, and where is the suffering coming from? Right? Normally we blame others. But if we start analyzing the mind, then we have to say, oh, suffering is actually coming from here, from me. <clears throat> right? So when we realize that, 
that all that what we experience today in terms of benefit is all coming from the kindness of others. And so others have benefited us not only in this life, but also in previous lives, right? The fact that we have this human life right now with all these good conditions is also coming from the kindness of others, right? We have created merit, yes, you know, you can maybe say, but I have created a merit, yes, but where do we create a merit? How? Independence upon others. Right? There is not one merit that we can create, not independence upon others. We either create merit in relation to sentient beings or in relation to the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas. Right? So even this body here with all the good fortune is coming about independence upon the kindness of others. <clears throat> And so in Buddhism, we very much emphasize, emphasize the relationship that we have with sentient beings, you know, not just in terms of, well, they were there and they were kind to us, but they were very, very close to us. Like all sentient beings have been our mothers, have been our fathers, have been our friends, have been um, other relatives, right? They're very, very close to us. So if we have the good fortune in this life to have a human body with all the, what we call the richnesses and the, and the freedoms, then how can we not use that to repay that kindness? How can we use this body and mind to say, well, I'm just going to work for the benefit of me. Right? I don't care about anybody else. As long as I'm fine, Right? Everything is fine for me. If we really understand where this is coming from, our human body with all the, all the good fortune that we have, if we really understand where it is coming from, how can we not repay that kindness? True? And that is not because you need to feel guilty, right? Oh, they did so much for me, now I have to pay back. No, it's like with pleasure, <laughs> with pleasure. It's like, how can I not, not engage in these actions? So then when I only work for the benefit of me, I should feel really, really bad. If I really understand these teachings, and I still decide I'm going to only work for me, I, I, I do not know how you do that without a bad feeling inside, you know, that actually <laughs> you should do something else. But I don't know. So what is the best way to help sentient beings? You know, we can help sentient beings in the sense of, um, you know, you ask me, oh, can you give me a tea? And I give you a tea and I've helped you, right? And I can help you with all the pleasures of samsara, right? And then you feel good. And then we have a nice relationship. But then what? Is that enough? Is that really the meaning of helping sentient beings? You know, and if we understand that sentient beings are suffering from the same things that we are suffering from, if you understand the sufferings of samsara and we, how we're all caught up in that, then the best way to help sentient beings is to free them from that suffering. Right? To help them out of samsara, to help them to free themselves from all the sufferings of samsara. So that means to find either liberation from samsara or to find enlightenment. Right? So when we talk about helping sentient beings, we are not talking about just working on the worldly level. Right? Because we have done that maybe also many, many, many lifetimes. I can give you whatever you are longing for, but you have received that millions of times in samsara, and you still want 
another time. <laughs> right? It's like they say we can drink the milk from samsara that is in samsara hundreds of times. And then we want to drink it again. And we want to drink it again. Like it is never enough, no matter how much we drink. The samsaric pleasures are never enough, no matter how much, how often we experience them. We will always want one more and one more. Right? So if my benefit is only focused on giving you samsaric pleasures, yes, you have some kind of experience of happiness or pleasure. Right? But then what? And you need more and you need more. And there is no end to that. And if we understand that the pleasures of samsara are actually coming, or the pleasures of samsara are in nature suffering themselves, right? Then how do I free you from suffering by giving you the pleasures of samsara? Do you get that? Do we understand that the sufferings, the pleasures that we experience are in the nature of suffering? <clears throat> One very good way of uh, describing the pleasures of samsara and showing that they are in the nature of suffering is by thinking about you are sitting there under the fan, right? Oh, I'm, I choose to sit under the fan. I'm nice and cool, right? And you sit there and you sit there for five minutes and you think, it's getting cold here, right? <laughs> so the moment that you think it's getting cold here, that what first appeared as a pleasure, wow, this is the best place. It's going to be nice and cool here. So that is, that is the moment where the suffering of cold starts, right? And then you stay sitting there, you sit there on that nice cool place and it starts to become more cold, more cold. So the suffering starts to arise until it reaches its peak and you say, oh no, I'm going to sit on the floor a little bit away from that fan, right? The moment you sit away from the fan, the, the, the suffering of sitting under the fan is finished and the suffering of sitting away from the fan starts. And in the beginning, it is like, oh, a very nice place, you know? But then it's like, oh, I'm sweating. It's kind of humid here and it doesn't feel nice. And, and so you will manage until you at a certain point feel like, no, 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 I have to get out of here. Right. So that moment that you get out of it, the, the, the suffering of sitting away from the fan is finished and another suffering is about to begin. That moment we call pleasure. Right. So I can give you these moments of pleasure many, many, many times, but it always will end up into suffering. It will never give you total freedom from suffering. True. Can you see that? Where should I sit? Where you sit? You sit. What do you mean? I know it sounds like a joke, but. It's not a joke. Where should I sit there? Yes. No, how, 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 should I, how should I sit? It doesn't really matter where you sit. But what we believe is that we can, we have some, somehow the belief that, not the belief, we are always looking for comfort and freedom of discomfort all the time aversion. Huh? Aversion. and so that is coming from attachment and aversion and so this the cause of all suffering is that so it is not the problem where you are sitting it is the problem that you think oh i chose the wrong place right you can also think i chose the perfect place okay there is some suffering there okay there is some suffering there no matter where I'm going to sit, no matter how many times I change, there's going to be some suffering. So what if I sit with the suffering and I know how to be with the suffering? Right? Then suffering comes and goes. Right? The suffering also is not going to stay. So you're sitting there and then, and then um, 
you're sitting now here and maybe that is a little bit more sweaty than sitting under the fan, but you deal with that. You sit through that. That's fine. Right? Then inside there is peace. But if I still have to believe like, uh, oh no, now I'm not feeling good here, now I'm going to change, and now I'm going to change, there's never peace. Right? So we cannot change samsara. We cannot change the fact that we have pleasant feelings and unpleasant feelings alternating in our body and mind. But what we can do is that we say, I'm not just going to run after that the whole time. I'm just going to sit with it and I'm going to experience whatever I experience and I'm going to observe it instead of reacting to it. Yes, when So how can you help the people who believe in 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 the pleasure of in the temporary pleasure, right? <clears throat> I mean, what we're trying to do is to understand, like, if we want to generate bodhicitta, and we talk about, I wish to benefit all sentient beings, and I wish to free them from all their suffering, what do we mean with that? Right? So I'm trying to explain, we're not focused on the worldly pleasures. When we want to become bodhisattvas, our aim is not focused on worldly pleasures. Right? We, what we try to do is we try to give sentient beings um, the freedom of suffering that comes from either liberation of enlightenment. So then we can say, what do we need to do in order to give that to sentient beings? Right? So then the answer to that is that we need to teach the Dharma, especially we need to teach on the nature of reality. Then, while we are striving to become a bodhisattva and to work in accordance with that. We are living our normal mm -hmm. life and we meet sentient beings who expect us to take care of them, right? And who expect us to relieve their suffering. So then when we can relieve their suffering, even if it is a temporary, a temporary relief, you know, there is still some benefit in that, right? So being a doctor, being a nurse, being a caretaker. Every time we relieve the suffering of sentient beings, um, we create merit. And for them, there is the benefit that they have less suffering. But that is not the ultimate method that you want to apply. Right? You do that with the knowledge. This is only going to give it a little, little relief of their suffering. I am not capable of giving complete relief of suffering. No matter what I try, I will not be able to do so. Because the nature of life is not like that. Right? So don't have the expectation that you can relieve someone from the, all their suffering. We cannot. Right? But we can do a little bit. By relieving people from their suffering temporarily, we create a bond with them, right? And so we can think at this moment, I don't have the skills to teach you how to become completely free of all your suffering, but may I do that in future lives, right? May we always be connected and may I be, once I have the skills, may I be of benefit to you. And so we can make these aspirational prayers. Right? Does that answer your question? I think. Just let me have a look if we need. Are there any questions from the. Can you see them? Yeah, there are. Oh, no sound. Oh, no, there is sound. Okay. There was for a few. <clears throat> Mm 
much yet. So do we do any questions? Does anyone have any questions or can we continue? <clears throat> But I don't see the people, right? So I cannot the view. Oh, okay. Yes. All okay, Venable. Okay, wonderful. <laughs> yeah, if you no want to see the people, you can just. Oh, sorry. Let's see the view. Hmm. It's all right. There, here are the few. Oh, thanks. Gallery. Mm. Yeah. An SK to everyone. Thank you. <laughs> this one. SK. <laughs> what about self compassion? Are we compri compromising on this when we keep others' benefit more than ours? Hmm. I think it depends on how you define self-compassion and what you really mean with that, <clears throat> right? If we say self-compassion is the wish for me to be free of suffering, then, and we think that suffering is the suffering of pain, you know, then I think the self-compassion that we have is quite shallow. And so then when we experience pain by helping others, we might think, oh, no, this is not good. I want to be free of this pain. Right. So then I'm not going to help others because it's going to hurt me too much. And and I have so much self-compassion. I don't want to have that suffering. <clears throat> So if we talk about self-compassion, which is a healthy foundation for developing compassion for others, and then self-compassion looks, for me, very much like renunciation. <clears throat> and so maybe when we start talking about how to develop compassion, we talk a little bit how to develop self-compassion. And also on the Sunday, we will talk about that, right? when we talk about compassion for self and others. So the self-compassion needs to be a healthy basis. And then I think we do not compromise on this when we keep the benefit of others in mind more than our own benefit. All right, Dusky, Venable. With dealing, while dealing with people suffering, do we also become a part of their karmic affections? What is a karmic affection? How does helping others, which is an effect of their bad karmic cycle, help us relieve of our own karmic cycle? Lavi, I'm not sure about what you mean with karmic affections and what you mean with affliction. Maybe. Lavi, is that what you mean? Karmic afflictions? Yes, he says. <clears throat> I think when you help others, how, why do you have to become a part of their afflictions? I don't really understand that. I think you can help people who are afflicted without be becoming afflicted yourself. And I think, let me just go up here. How does helping others, which is an effect of their bad karmic cycle, help us relief of our karmic cycle? I, I'm not sure if the way that you speak about karma, I would agree on that. 
I think helping others is not an effect of their bad karmic cycle. You know, if we have the wish to help others, that is also coming about, that wish is also coming about due to the karma of others. You know, and if I have a bodhicitta mind that wishes to help others, whoever is in front of me has the karma to be in front of me. And then I help them as much as I can. And the way they will receive my help is in accordance to their karma. Right? That has nothing to do, that is not, that is, I think it is good karma, right? When we meet a bodhisattva who's willing to help us. It's good karma, it's not a negative karma. <clears throat> yes. Wait. Wait one second. What an interesting development. There are no. There are any. I don't think that mantras help us to purify the mind. You know, and they help us to generate merit. Um, but not so much. So you can use that merit and a purification in order to develop bodhicitta. But the mantra themselves does not is not become the cause of bodhicitta. Let's just consider that we all who suffer is because of our past bad karmas. Yes, everyone who is suffering is suffering because of their own karma. That's true. That's true. Yes, Nietzsche. Yes. When the egg and sperm come together, I'm just repeating it for the for the mic. <laughs> um, and at that moment, you have the form of a body, which comes with its karma and movement. Are we talking about the moment when a consciousness enters that form of a body with its very own karma and evolution, or the karma and evolution of the parents, which Um, the body comes from the parents, does that mean that we inherit their karma and delusions? So karma and illusions are seated in the mind. They're not seated in the body. Karma and our body is ruled by karma and delusions. Mm. It's in control, it's controlled by karma and delusions. Then this comes back to where does the mind sit? Where does the mind? Where can you find the mind? Where can you find the mind? Um, so when we take a body, when we when we take rebirth in a body, that body fits exactly our karma and delusions, right? So when we say that the body produces karma and delusions, right? That our body is made by karma and delusion, so that is, they they are they are interlinked with each other. They influence each other, right? The karma and the body. The body that I have completely matches my karma. It completely matches my delusions that I have from past lives. Right? Or maybe bad habits that I have from past lives or anything like that. My body is exactly in accordance with that. My parents are exactly in accordance with that. So yes, we sometimes talk about uh, that uh, we, have, we have, for instance, uh, traumas from our parents and our bodies, right? Or from our grandparents. Or uh, some people say they're stored in the DNA. Other people are saying you know, other ways of body memories. Um, so there are different ways of explaining that. Um, but somehow I think it must be related to your mind as well. It cannot be that we accept some memories of somebody else without it having anything to do with us. 
right? In Buddhism, they say whatever is in your mind that you have accepted, it's yours. <laughs> it's yours, right? So, so although I might be aware of certain traumas that my parents have experienced, the fact that I, I am aware of that or I experience them in, in my body and mind shows that I have the karma to do so. Right? Otherwise it becomes, you, you just somehow say, okay, there's karma and then there are all these other things that we inherit. <laughs> it becomes difficult. It was, why are you born there? And why do you feel that, but your sister doesn't? Right, a difficult thing to think about. Shall we talk a little bit about the self-cherishing mind? Our favorite mind, right? The one that we do so much for, that we are so full of. <clears throat> So what is that self-cherishing mind? And those who have heard teachings before, we all have heard about the self-grasping mind, right? The mind that holds on to a self in a way that that self that we hold on to appears in a certain way, but it doesn't exist at all like that. Have you heard about these teachings? Self-grasping mind? No. So in Buddhism, we all have a self, right? The self, me, I, that we experience. And that self, we experience that particularly when we are emotionally, when we're angry, when we're very attached, when we can't get what we want, you know? The I is right there. And the way that I appears, it appears as a single entity. It appears standing in and of itself, sometimes as if it has nothing to do with the body and the mind, as if it is separate from the body and the mind. True? And it appears, so it appears to be independent of the body and the mind. And it appears to be permanent, permanent in the sense that it's not changing. My I that I feel inside is the same as that I had yesterday, five years ago. It's always that same entity. True? Or not? Do we have that appearance of a self or not? So that self in Buddhism, we say that self that appears as a unitary, permanent, independent, self such a self does not exist such a self does not exist so the self appears in a way that it doesn't exist or the self doesn't exist in the way it appears so there is some kind of misconception about reality the way we perceive the self is not in accordance with how the self exists in actuality. And actually the way the self appears is totally opposite to how the self exists. Then how does the self exist? The self is not unitary, but it exists out of many parts. The self is not independent of the mind, of, of the body and the mind. The self is dependent upon the body and the mind. And the self is not permanent, but the self is impermanent. It is changing moment to moment. So the way it appears to us is totally opposite to the way it exists in actuality. So because it appears as this in and of itself, autonomous, objective entity, we feel we need to take care of that self and we need to protect that self. Right? So how do we do that? The way that we take care of the self is that we like the self, the self wants to be happy, right? 
and the self does not want to suffer. Not just the self, we all. Not just this self that we see, but we as human beings, we as sentient beings, we all want to be happy. We don't want to be suffer. Right? There is nothing wrong with that. This is an innate drive that we have, which we should not try to get rid of. This is part of our nature. Right? So that drive is there. Then how do we look for that happiness? So the way we do it in dependence upon that self. When I, the self, I experience pleasant feelings, my attachment comes. Oh, I want more of this. I want to hold on to this. I want to become closer to that object that gave me that pleasant feeling. Right? And the moment that I experience something unpleasant, I say, oh, I don't want to be close to that. I want to be separated from this. So my aversion comes. Right? So what my mind does, and dependence on that self, the moment I experience unpleasantness, there is aversion, trying to suppress trying to separate the I from that unpleasantness. The moment I experience something pleasant, there is attachment trying to hold on to that pleasant experience that I feel as happiness. Right? I am happy. Attachment is there. I want more. I want more. I want more of this happiness. <clears throat> right? So attachment and aversion comes in dependence upon the feelings. So the self-cherishing mind follows the feelings, right? The self-cherishing mind finds happiness by holding on to pleasant feelings and by trying to separate from unpleasant feelings. So that mechanism, that is called the self-cherishing mind. We are busy with that all the time. Right? When we are sitting, listening to it all the time, in the back of the mind, there is this, this, what is it? It is, um, it is a kind of a sensor, you know? Am I still okay? Am I still okay? Am I comfortable? Oh, not so comfortable. I need to change my position. <laughs> I would like some water. I would like this. I would like, and then we give that to ourselves as much as we can. Right? Kind of self-obsessed. Right? This self obsession feeling because we have this I and then we have this wanting to be happy and not wanting to suffer. We are all the time busy with trying to give that to ourselves. So that makes that my happiness, therefore, is more important than your happiness in my mind. Right? That is not like, oh, you're so selfish because you want, it's not even conscious. But the way the mind works, there is a strong sense of self. And then there is this wish to be happy. And so, and then we all, that is what we are looking for. I'm not feeling yourself. I'm not feeling your feelings. So that makes it very difficult to work for you. Right? I don't feel your feelings. I don't feel any of your feelings. But I feel mine. Right? So I'm working for me all the time to find comfort and to find freedom from discomfort. True, this is like a, 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 our suffering that we all have. You know, this is human nature. This is not just human nature. This is sentient beings nature. It happens automatically like that. Due to habituation. My feeling is there. My self is there. I want to be happy and there it happens. So we call that notion of self, of that independent self, we call that self-grasping. And we call that looking all the time for its happiness and freedom from suffering, we call that self-cherishing. Because I feel myself the whole time, my, the self is there and our feelings are there and I'm there to witness that. You know, there is something that 
um, because I'm present here, right? I feel that, so then I react to that. It is an emotional reaction. We don't need our rational mind to come in between. We don't need anything. We do that even during our sleep. We do that during, um, you know, any, any circumstances. We do it. We cannot stop doing that. It's very difficult to stop. Maybe when you are a very good people pleaser, you can kind of hide that. You know, you have buried that very, very deep inside you. But it's still there. It's still somehow active. Right? We just not be aware of it. So we cannot just stop that. So the self-grasping mind is called the root of all suffering. Once we cut that root, once we see that the self does not exist like that, and we see it not just by thinking, but by really truly seeing it with our mental consciousness, then that self-grasping is gone, then all the suffering is gone. <clears throat> because the attachment and aversion arises independence on that notion of self. Right? So when I realize that that self doesn't exist, also attachment and anger or attachment and aversion cannot arise anymore like that. Right? So in order to realize that 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 self does not exist in the way it appears. We need to realize emptiness. In order to realize emptiness, we need to develop our wisdom mind. How we see things, how we see reality. <clears throat> That's one thing that we need to do. In order to realize or in order to realize, in order to address that self-cherishing mind, you know, until we realize emptiness directly, we can, we can not use our, we can use our wisdom mind a little bit, you know, but the main thing is that what we need to do, we need to change that automatic reaction. That automatic reaction is now focused on, I want to be happy. And I'm serving that self all the time. If I want to change that, what the way that we change that is that we change the self for others. So I'm going to make a habit that I'm not just focused on me, but I'm all the time focused on others. So by working for the sake of others, I'm addressing my self cherishing mind. Can you see that? Can you see that? Stop. It's tough. Uh, then, then we're going to say how we're going to do that. Um, because it's very tough. Hmm. Because we have to change we're actually not even changing that automatic reaction so that reaction is there you cannot do i mean it will become less um, prominent when you start developing your wisdom mind and when you but then we want to shift its 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 object right you just shift its object so the reaction is still there but you have changed the object so instead of working for just for yourself, you are only working for others. You change, I'm working for me, into I'm working for others. And that can stay the same, yes. Yes. So we'll talk about how we're going to do this. <clears throat> but you can see that the way we react at the moment is very self-centered. And if we look into that self-centeredness, what it actually wants, what the self actually wants, the self wants to be happy now. Now. At least in this life. 
right? So that is concerned with me and with just this life. It is a very limited mind, right? Very close-minded, very self-centered. So what we want to do is we actually want to open up that mind. We want to make the mind very, very wide and very go very deep with that mind. Right? So instead of thinking about just this life or now, you know, I'm going to open up and I'm going to, somebody once said that becoming enlightened is actually the most mature mind because you postpone your gratification, which is happiness until very, very, very far away. You know, if we look into the self cherishing mind, that is a mind that says, I want to be happy now. I want to have a coffee. I want a coffee now. Right. Or you wait for your coffee. Oh, then all oh, these, these uh, addictive uh, hormones, they start to come and they say, no, 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 I can't wait. No, no. Oh, okay. I'll go to another shop. Oh, I'll go. I'll try there. We want to have the coffee. Right. I want it now. I cannot postpone my gratification. I cannot postpone that experience of happiness. That is a very immature mind, right? The more attachment we have, the, the more difficult it is to postpone, right? So if we develop bodhicitta, or oh, let's first go to, so this is what we normally do. Then there are things that we can postpone till next week. Or there are things that we can postpone till our pension, you know, we already put some money away for our pension later. But we don't postpone till next life. Do we? Oh, I'll give this now to this beggar so that next life it will come back to me. We normally don't think like that. But if we can postpone our gratification till next life, is even a more mature mind, right? Or we might say, I don't know if it's going to come back and when it's going to come back, I do it anyway. Something that makes me happy, I'm going to give it away. And by doing that, I actually feel happy, whether that comes back or not. Right? That is a more mature mind than the mind that says, I want it now. Right? So then we can postpone to the next life. Now we can also postpone to the moment that we um, experience the happiness, which is a complete freedom of all suffering, which is liberation from samsara. But I can also postpone my happiness to Buddhahood. And so the longer I can postpone the happiness, the bigger the gratification is going to be. So the happiness of enlightenment is much bigger than the happiness of liberation. And the liberation is much bigger than the happiness of future lives. And the happiness of future lives is much bigger than the happiness that we get here from having the coffee. Right? So postponing makes us more mature. If we have a lot of attachment, it's very difficult to postpone. But training and postponing can help us to address our attachment. Right? If you can postpone, for instance, what we do, what, what happens at the moment, many people do intermittent fasting. Right? So you're going to wait with giving yourself what you want to have. You want to wait. And by that waiting, you create a kind of a strength in yourself, right? Then when something doesn't come exactly the moment you want it, you're okay with that. You can deal with that. Your mind has the, the, the capacity to stay calm, to be okay, to let it go, to not worry about it. Okay? Because you are training yourself in learning that habit. So that's with fasting, but we can do that with many things. But it's the same principle. Yeah. 
Suppose you have planned certain things. You have a plan of vacation, yes. If I have a plan that I wanna that I wanna visit fifty countries in the next five years and it doesn't happen. Anything. Yes, situation changes and then it's not tr possible to travel. Yeah. Then how do I deal with that? Yeah. yeah, what would you say to a little child? <laughs> Sorry, we'll do it later. We'll do it later. And the child says, no, mommy, now, now. Then what do you say? The situation is not right, you know. And so, do you, so somehow, whatever you plan for is not working out, which means that that the karma is not there, right? The karma is not there. We have to accept. Sometimes we oh, and then I'll change the plan and I'll do it later. But we can also investigate was that a clever plan, right? Or we can investigate our own attitude that we think, uh, I want this, right? We, we have these ideas, I want this, I need to do this in my life. It's all about me, it's all about this life, right? Is that wise, right? Or can we do something better with our life? If you would die while you have done all that and you haven't done anything else in life, how would you die? Would you feel good about yourself? Or would you think, hmm, you know, uh, I spent, everything in life just for me. I didn't give to others. I didn't, I wasn't there for others. I didn't offer my service to others. What makes you feel better? Right. So you can question. Sometimes when things don't happen, I, I, I think, you know, maybe it wasn't meant to be. And I personally feel that the more I let life happen the way it happens and let go of all these wants, you know, the more free I feel and the more happy I feel and the more things are actually happening so perfectly, right? That I wonder, what did I do in the beginning of my life? Maybe I was obstructing all the things that actually needed to happen in my life by having all these wants, you know, these ideas, oh, I need to do this, I need to do this in order to be happy, in order to feel good about myself, in order to be successful. Maybe I was more in the way of my own happiness than when I just go with what is happening. Right? We all learn you need a goal in your life, you need to know what you want, you need to. But what if you just offer service to others? Gandhi says that. That's Gandhi. You say that. <laughs> what did he say? The best way to find yourself is to lose yourself in service of others. The best way to find yourself is to lose yourself in service of others. That is so beautiful. That is so beautiful. Hmm. So the the moment that we want something, you know, it is the self cherishing mind that is. Unless we. I shouldn't say that because then if I say I want to become enlightened, you know, that is not my self cherishing mind. But if we talk about goals in this life, I want this in this life, it's always our self cherishing mind. Always. And they say that all our suffering is coming from that self cherishing mind. So when things are not happening the way we want them, and we start demanding them. We have to be very careful <laughs> because we might actually, most likely we are creating a lot of suffering for ourselves. We have to be very, very careful. Right? Learning the, the art of letting go is very helpful. It didn't happen, okay, I let go. You know, instead of holding on, no, it has to happen. Mm-hmm. <laughs> 
<clears throat> so if we compare Dharma and, and the way that we live life, you know, or, or, or the way we use our attachment, when attachment is there, and we live our life in accordance with following our attachment. Life has very little meaning. Life can become very empty, you know. Oh yeah, I got what I wanted, but I'm still not happy. Because inside I feel empty, or I feel lonely, or I feel like meaningless. It's all meaningless. But when we practice Dharma, everything we are doing becomes meaningful. Everything we're doing has a meaning. Then, although we might not have a lot of money, we might not have uh, even not many friends, not many whatever, but inside we feel like I'm feeling good about myself. My life has meaning because I've done something for somebody else. Right? This is very important. We're all looking for that. Right? We're all looking for feeling deeply connected, feeling that our meaning, that our life makes a difference, that our life has a meaning. Right? Then we have to stop focusing on the pleasures of this life, because that is never, ever, ever going to bring any meaning, nothing. Right? Does it mean that we cannot have any pleasures in life? Pleasures are still there, and we can fully enjoy them, but they're not the purpose of our life. Right? They're nice byproducts that we can enjoy, but they're not the purpose. My purpose is not to chase happy feelings, good experiences, one after the other. That's not the purpose of my life. But by working for the benefit of others or by practicing Dharma, by making my life meaningful, I can have many good experiences while living that life. And all these good experiences I can fully enjoy. Nothing wrong with that. All right, you guys are tired. You're tired? <clears throat> huh? Okay. Eight thirty p.m. What do you say? I have to. No, no. I see some people struggling. <laughs> yeah, they do. They do. They do. Are there any questions so far? Let me check online. Are there any questions? Yeah. Where do we draw the line? So we are baby bodhisattvas, right? Or we are aspiring baby bodhisattvas. So we, our mind is still quite weak, right? So we have to slowly, slowly strengthen the mind. Right? One way of strengthening the mind is um, by practicing wisdom, by really understanding what is it that I really need. Right? Because the mind needs, they are very strongly connected to attachment, right? And we are very used to give ourselves everything that we need. But we can check how much do I really need that, right? Sometimes I needs I find very interesting. So when we start <clears throat> working for the benefit of others, we have to know how to work for the benefit of ourselves, right? Because working for the benefit of others is part of working for the benefit of ourselves. And so before we can generate bodhicitta, 
before we can generate the mind that wishes to achieve enlightenment, we need to have a mind that wishes to be liberated from samsara. That mind is not fully developed. It is not a mind that is uh, what we call uncontrived. It is not a mind that spontaneously comes because if we would develop that mind so strongly, then we would enter into the Hinayana path, which we do not want. So, but we need to have the mind that says, I want to become free of samsara. Right? That mind is a contrived mind. And once that mind is there, then we start to focus on other sentient beings and we say, well, I want to be free of samsara, but um, I'm not the only one who is suffering here. There's so many others, right? I cannot just get out of samsara and leave them all behind. So in order to know how I can become free of samsara, I need to engage in certain actions, right? That are going to help me to free, be free from samsara, which are... I need to stop engaging in harmful actions. I need to start engaging in, in, in uh, virtuous actions. I need to create merit. I need to, so I need to practice ethics. Then I need to practice concentration. And then I need to practice wisdom. Okay. We rely on the three trainings in order to become liberated from samsara. <clears throat> So these, and I think that is the true meaning of self-compassion. How do I stop myself from suffering? By stopping to engage in harmful actions towards others. Right? What is the cause of suffering? Harmful actions towards others. So if I want suffering to be stopped, I have to stop engaging in harmful actions. Right? We think I stop suffering by avoiding any unpleasantness. Buddhism says that's not the way to stop suffering. Right? So the way we take care of our needs is similar, right? Oh, I use my aversion to stop suffering and I follow my attachment to give myself what I need. Right? This is how we do it normally. But if you realize that when you try to stop your suffering with your aversion, you're actually creating the causes for more suffering. And when you realize that you uh, create more suffering by getting what you need with your attachment, right? you have to find other ways of giving yourself what you need and stopping any unpleasantness. So we do that by stopping the harmful actions. Right? Then we start benefiting others because with that we create karma for pleasant experiences, which we still like, which we still need. Right? So the pleasure comes from that, from your virtuous actions. Right? <clears throat> Then how do we stop harm? We think that we need to stop harm by using our aversion, by using our anger. But what really stops harm is our compassion. And we think that we need to get, in order to get what we need, we need to use our attachment. But if we really look into what we need, then it is compassion that gives us what we need. Or loving kindness. Right? If you look into your needs and you look deeper, 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 you find I need love. I need to be loved. Right? Where is that coming from? From loving others. Right? I need to lo I need love. Love comes from loving others. The cause for being loved is that we love others. True. Sure. 
So we have to shift our mind, right? Yes, I know I need what I, I, there are things that I need. There are things that I want to be free of in order to be able to function. But we need to change our thinking about that. Thinking deeper, you know, because the moment the way we take care of our needs is by our attachment and our aversion. And so that you need to rethink. Is that really true? The way I believe it works. Because it's not true. Attachment and aversion appear as the things that are making us happy and giving us freedom from suffering, but they're not. We really, want really in a, at the place of our like need or something. Um, what would you say as well? That sometimes, like for example, like you need something for the comfort of your pain, for example. And maybe like you have pain in your leg and you need to rest it or something. And and if it is still not, something is still obstructing that. Yes. Or someone is Yes. So then you can give yourself temporary relief, right, from, from your suffering. Sometimes we also need some pleasures in order to be able to keep going, right? It's okay to give that to yourself. But you give it to yourself not because you know that that is what is going to bring you real happiness, but that you need some relief from your suffering in order to be able to keep going. But your goal is still, I want to keep going. I want to achieve Buddhahood. I want to develop Bodhicitta. But you have to be very careful with your attachment. And so I'm not saying that when you're in pain, you just laugh at us and then something will happen that is going to shift that, right? It's, <laughs> it also doesn't work like that. Um, but pain comes from the self cherishing mind. Right? Oh, I don't want this. I don't want this. I don't want this. Most of the pain that we experience, 90% of the pain that we experience is our aversion to an unpleasant experience that we don't want to feel. Right? So how can I feel that unpleasant feeling that is sitting there in my system that I have so much aversion to, that I keep fighting that? Does that sound resonates? Yeah. Hmm. Good. All right. Let me look at the questions here in the chat. And then we're going to maybe finish off. For avoiding suffering, do we differentiate in terms of where we need to start first, avoiding harmful thoughts or actions, so both simultaneously, which is considered relatively easier to approach first? To avoid suffering, we need to, I mean, when we start creating causes, um, when we start changing our actions, so that we don't, so that we stop creating the causes of suffering, right? That first starts in the mind, then in our actions. But sometimes it's also easier that even if you have a negative thought, to stop the action. <clears throat> I'm not sure I was clear. So sometimes they say it is easier to stop the actions of the body first before you stop the actions of the mind. Um, so you can start there. Not killing, not harming physically is easier than stopping the mind that wants to engage in that action. My question is, how is it that we can easily recognize suffering and respect a solution for others and not our own? We just do not realize when our suffering started. What can we do and how can we recognize the onset when we are inside the state of suffering before we have really suffered a lot? 
you know, when we start talking about this, we actually, we want to just have this one solution that's going to free us, right? Oh, I want to stop all the suffering. But we're going to go very, 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 very slow. And we have to rethink these ideas again and again and again. And then all kinds of questions come up. How are we going to do this? How are we going to do that? Sometimes we cannot answer them like that. You know, you have to sit with the information that you received and think about it again and again and again. Like, how is that possible? How is it possible? I also don't have all the answers, you know, and I've been thinking a lot myself. How is that possible? Even in terms of body data, how can you do that? How can you overcome your self cherishing mind? You know, it's extremely difficult. So how can we easily recognize suffering? We cannot easily recognize suffering. We can easily recognize the suffering of pain, but it is not easy to recognize the suffering of change. And it is definitely not easy to recognize the all pervasive suffering, which is the most subtle suffering. So we need to reflect on that again and again and again. And yes, we don't realize when our suffering started. It is like <laughs> eons ago, it's from the beginning. We don't know. <clears throat> and sometimes we don't even recognize that we are suffering. That's true. We don't recognize that. And so we think, oh, I'm happy. I'm so happy. I have such a good life. But in actuality, we are suffering. Right? You just don't call it like that. And so you can recognize the suffering that you recognize as suffering that is where you start and then you try to address that you try to think about it what are the causes of this how can i change that and then when you start doing that the mind becomes somehow more purified the mind becomes a little bit more subtle and you can see more then another level of suffering comes and you say oh wow i didn't see that before it must have been there but I never saw it. I never recognized it as suffering. Oh, now I see it. Oh, where is that coming from? What are the causes for this and what can I do about it? And so we go layer by layer by layer by layer. It's not that we can just do it all in one go, you know? Um, so whatever you can recognize, that is where you start. Then you reflect on the causes of that suffering, and then you reflect on what can I do to address that suffering. Any more questions here? So what are the causes for suffering in terms of when people are rude to me or don't behave in a way I expect them to behave? Um, one very simple way of uh, thinking about this is that whatever people do to you is you must have done that to us. So when somebody is rude to you, then you think, oh, that means I must have done that to others, right? And then you feel how you feel and you think, wow, I feel quite shitty. I don't like to feel like that, but I made other people feel like that. So I have to stop being rude to others. Where am I rude to others? But the fact that it ripens on you, the fact that people are rude to you, then you can lose. So first you say, I've done that to others. That is how you say, come, I finished. But do you have a habit in your own mind of being rude to others? So you check. How do I think about others? How do I treat others? And so when you find any rudeness there, you say, I need to change that. <clears throat> if you don't find any rudeness, great. The habit is not there. It was just an experience, right? But often when things happen, more often in life, we have a tendency to be ourselves like that. Even if we don't really express it, you know, but in our thinking somewhere, there is a tendency. So that is the main one that we need to address. I'm going to work on that. I'm going to be more respectful to others. I'm going to be more uh, acting in accordance to what they wish for, what they expect from me. Then things will change. Yeah. Okay. All right. 
<clears throat> so next time we'll talk a little bit about the benefits of bodhicitta and about the the what we all need in order to develop bodhicitta and we talk about the prerequisite of bodhicitta which is equanimity right that self-cherishing mind that has such a preference for one thing and not for another thing that is actually what is stopping us most from developing bodhicitta right our we all have compassion we all have loving kindness but we only have it for those that we like right self-centered is based on the self-cherishing mind so our mind is biased you know for those that we don't uh, that we don't like for those to, that we have that have harmed us right the mind that we have is not i want you to be free of suffering but we think i want you to suffer right? that is a very biased mind based on the self-cherishing mind so how do we develop equanimity so that we have a good foundation for where we can start developing the bodhicitta mind i have the feeling that you're all falling asleep <laughs> Let's dedicate a merit quickly. Yes. Huh? Dedicate. Let's dedicate. Yes. <laughs> so we do a very quick dedication. First of all, we 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 dedicate so for a very 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 quick return of uh, Lama Zupa Rinpoche that he may come quickly and manifest even more than before his bodhicitta mind work for the benefit of all sentient beings and when he manifests in, in in a in a new body that we may be very 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 close to him and we also dedicate for the long life of all our spiritual teachers especially his holiness the dalai lama and for the happiness and well-being of all sentient beings and so whatever bodhicitta we already have in our mind, may that become, may that keep growing bigger and bigger. And whatever bodhicitta has not yet arisen in our mind, may that arise. Thank you all for being here. I wish I could see all you all. Can you turn on your cameras? Hi. <laughs> Hi. So nice to see you. <laughs> I hope you're going to come back tomorrow. Tomorrow, right? Tomorrow, 6.30, we continue the teachings. All right. Take care. Bye-bye. <laughs> see you tomorrow. How do I just finish? Oh, I end. Thank you, Vanessa.